From fledgling government computer labs to the engine room of the global digital economy, this is the story of how a nation of a billion people embraced technology, defied expectations, and built a technological and innovation powerhouse. For over two centuries, the Indian subcontinent served as a vast colonial laboratory for exploitation. Its lands were drained, its industries dismantled, and its people subordinated to the logic of empire. The British Raj did not merely conquer territory. It de-developed one of the world's oldest civilizations, engineering poverty from a position of profit. When the Union Jack finally came down in 1947, what remained was a nation politically sovereign but economically shattered. Yet from the ruins of colonial extraction, a new India set out not to mimic the West but to build a different kind of modernity, one rooted in autonomy, equity, and technological self-determination. India's first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, envisioned not a return to the past, but a march toward a future forged through science and state planning. He believed that only through national control over education, industry, and innovation could India avoid becoming a pawn in the post-colonial chessboard of Cold War geopolitics. And so began the Great Experiment. Across the newly liberated nation, public institutions were erected like cathedrals of steel and silicon. The Indian Institutes of Technology, founded with assistance from countries like the Soviet Union and West Germany, were designed not to produce workers for foreign corporations, but to cultivate technocrats who would serve the needs of a developing, self-reliant India. In tandem, India constructed a network of state-run enterprises in aviation, defense, telecommunications, and heavy engineering. From Bharat Electronics to Hindustan Aeronautics, these public sector giants anchored strategic capabilities in Indian hands. At the heart of this industrial base stood the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, created not to compete in a Cold War space race, but to deliver social transformation via satellite, whether forecasts for farmers, education for rural schools, and communications for the remotest corners of the subcontinent. But India's techno-nationalism was not without contradiction. In rejecting dependence on Western capital, it developed a bureaucratic labyrinth that would become known as the License Raj, a stifling tangle of red tape that choked private innovation and locked entrepreneurship behind closed doors. The ideal of sovereignty turned inward, ossified by inefficiency. Yet even in these suffocating years of economic control, the Indian state never relinquished its desire to build indigenous capability, and in the shadows of delay and dysfunction, something quietly began to emerge. The emigration of Indian engineering talent, not by accident, but by structural design. As India closed itself to global capital, the West opened its gates to Indian mines. By the 1970s and 80s, graduates of IITs and other elite technical institutions were populating research labs and tech firms across North America and Europe. This was not mere brain drain. It was a form of soft extraction. While India struggled with its internal contradictions, its intellectual surplus became the backbone of foreign innovation. This diaspora would later become one of India's greatest strategic assets. But in the early decades, it also symbolized the profound asymmetry of the global knowledge economy. Still, there were moments of brilliance even within constraint. In 1970, India passed one of its most revolutionary laws, a new patent act that abolished product patents in pharmaceuticals and allowed Indian firms to reverse engineer essential medicines. It was a direct challenge to Western monopoly power. While multinational corporations guarded their patents and priced the poor out of treatment, Indian companies like Cipla and Dr. Reddy's developed life-saving generics, not just for India, but for the entire global South. India was already innovating for the world, not through venture capital, but through defiance. The decisive turning point came in 1991, faced with a balance of payments crisis. India's foreign reserves had fallen so low that it was forced to mortgage its gold. The International Monetary Fund demanded structural adjustments, and the Indian state complied. Tariffs were slashed. Licensing was dismantled. Foreign direct investment flooded in. It was, in many ways, an economic surrender, a retreat from the Nehruvian dream of socialist planning into the arms of global finance. But amidst this great liberalization emerged an unlikely winner, software. Unlike steel or oil, 
Software didn't require ports, pipelines, or raw materials. What it needed was human capital, something India had in abundance. With a technically educated English-speaking workforce and a time zone advantage, India quickly became the world's back office. The government responded by launching Software Technology Parks of India, offering tax breaks and satellite uplinks to enable high-speed communication with clients in the West. Y2K. The infamous computer glitch threatening to destabilize global systems at the turn of the millennium became India's moment. Thousands of engineers were contracted to fix the problem, proving India's reliability in crisis and opening the floodgates of global IT outsourcing. Companies like Infosys, Wipro, and Tata Consultancy Services weren't just service providers, they became architects of a new model of economic development, exporting intelligence, not materials. They pioneered the global delivery model, wherein work was seamlessly distributed across continents, creating a 24-hour productivity cycle that reshaped the global division of labor. India had, in effect, found a way to extract value from the very system that once exploited it. Meanwhile, the Indian diaspora and Silicon Valley ascended from cubicles to boardrooms. Sundar, Pichai Satya, Nadella, and Arvan Krishna, Indian-born executives, who would go on to lead Google, Microsoft, and IBM symbolized not just individual success, but a deeper geopolitical truth. India was no longer merely exporting labor. It was exporting leadership. These figures, along with thousands of Indian engineers, venture capitalists, and entrepreneurs, became cultural and financial bridges linking India's domestic ecosystem with global networks of capital and innovation. But India refused to become a digital colony of Silicon Valley. While it embraced globalization and software, it retained a skeptical posture toward unregulated data flows and foreign tech hegemony. This became particularly evident in the 2010s. As tensions between U.S. tech giants and the Indian state intensified, India resisted Facebook's free basics program, which sought to control the Internet experience for millions under the guise of connectivity. It demanded data localization, challenged content moderation biases, and refused to allow multinational firms to operate above its laws. Unlike many developing nations, India refused to trade sovereignty for speed. In 2015, the Indian government launched Digital India, a massive campaign to digitize governance, financial systems, and service delivery across the country. But unlike the neoliberal model that privatizes everything digital, India's approach was rooted in public infrastructure. ADAR, the world's largest biometric ID system, enrolled over a billion people, enabling access to services, subsidies, and identity verification. UPI, the Unified Payments Interface, made digital payments seamless and nearly free. Empowering millions and outpacing the world in real-time transactions, Indiastack, a series of open APIs built on top of ADAR and UPI, allowed private developers to build scalable solutions for banking, health, education, and commerce, all riding on state-led rails. This was a unique phenomenon in global tech, a massive open-source digital public infrastructure that delivered inclusion at scale, not through monopolies, but through modular, interoperable tools. While big tech monetized user data and trapped nations in dependency, India built a model of digital sovereignty, one now being adopted by countries from Africa to Southeast Asia. But India's technological rise didn't stop at the cloud. In 2023, the Indian Space Research Organization landed Chandrayaan-3 on the moon's south pole the first nation to do so, and it did it on a budget smaller than most Hollywood blockbusters. India's space program was no longer just symbolic, it was strategic. The country began offering satellite launches for dozens of nations, asserting itself as a spacefaring power for the global south. Simultaneously, India began investing in next-generation technologies. It launched sovereign initiatives in artificial intelligence, including multilingual language models for its diverse population, and opened quantum research centers. It negotiated major semiconductor manufacturing deals with companies like Micron and launched domestic chip design programs. Unlike China, which relied on massive state subsidies, or the U.S., which depended on legacy corporations, India was attempting something different, 
scaling up innovation without compromising its democratic framework. Perhaps most importantly, India began exporting not just goods or services, but ideology, a philosophy of technological development rooted in dignity, access, and sovereignty. Its digital public infrastructure is now being deployed in nations like Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, and the Philippines. I'm unlike Western aid or Chinese loans, these tools come without conditions. There's no privatization clauses, no surveillance spyware, no strings. India's rise is not a Silicon Valley fairy tale. It is not the result of trickle-down globalization or passive integration into Western-led systems. It is the product of struggle, of resisting imperial dependency, of nurturing domestic institutions, of leveraging the diaspora without surrendering to it. It is the outcome of deliberate choices made by a sovereign state seeking to uplift its people, not just its GDP. The journey is far from perfect. Inequality remains vast. Infrastructure gaps persist. And the threats of digital authoritarianism must be constantly checked. But unlike many nations of the global north, India is still in the act of becoming, still fighting to shape its own destiny, rather than manage decline. In a world where data is the new oil and algorithms shape democracy, India stands as a rare example of a post-colonial state that has refused to surrender its technological soul. It has coded its own path on its own terms. This is not just the story of India's digital transformation. It is the revenge of the formerly colonized. Written in code, launched into orbit, and now shared with the world. And it has only just begun. And don't forget, like the video and subscribe the channel to keep thinking the world how it really is.